Hello, welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I am coming at you from the Pacific Northwest where the sun shines so bright to only to rain a few hours later. I am your host, Logan. Obviously, my podcast is named after me. I hope you are all having a great day. Maybe you're listening to this while you're at work, while you're working out, while you're browsing the internet, or maybe while you drive. Who knows? I don't, and it doesn't really matter. On this podcast, I talk about all things liberty, and since the show is named after me, honestly, I talk about whatever the hell I want to talk about. So without further ado, let us talk about the lunacy that is liberal ideology. First of all, let me define liberalism for the sake of this video. When I talk about liberals, I am referring to the left-wing progressives who typically identify with the Democratic Party or even the Green Party. I'm talking about socialist and communist sympathizers. So if you are a classical liberal or you know what a real liberal is, do not take offense to what I am saying. This isn't an us versus them type of video or podcast. There is plenty I dislike about Republicans, but this podcast is entitled, as you can tell, um, Republican Retardation or uh, Inconsistent Conservatives or anything else like that. I am throwing punches to the left or at the left, I should say. Basically, I'm starting with a left hook, a right hook, left uppercut, shoot, takedown, and armbar. And no, I'm not wearing a tap-out shirt. Don't think I'm one of those guys. So, without further ado, let's get started right into this podcast about liberal lunacy. Because there is a lot of liberal lunacy that goes on. You can turn on the news and liberal lunacy is everywhere. I'm not talking about your standard SJW liberal lunacy either. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm drink some water first. When I wake up, my mouth is always dry. It's 9 a.m. for me right now as I'm recording this. <clears throat> so, one thing that I find hilarious is that liberals claim to be the party of choice. Of course, they're only talking about abortion and maybe even marijuana. But when it comes to what you want to consume, well, seemingly uh they want to talk they want they want the they want to be able to decide what you get to consume. What am I talking about? Well, health advocates tried passing a soda tax in California. Of course, this is California we are talking about, so it's not surprising. They put a tax on anything that they can, basically. And that's not a diss on the entirety of California. California has a lot of great people. At the California State Capitol last Thursday, which, uh, in context of this article, this was Thursdays ago, a few Thursdays ago, teenage health advocates from Stockton urged lawmakers to stand with communities like theirs and put people's health over corporate profits. After more than a year of knocking on doors, talking with people at farmers markets, and attending community events to build support for a soda tax in their city, these young activists were up against an unexpected challenge. A state law that would render their efforts meaningless by banning cities from adopting soda taxes until 2030. Good. It, this isn't about corporate profits. This is about you wanting to control what other people consume. That's what that's about. You think that you get to say or have a say in what other people do with their lives. And what I really hate about this is, especially in a place like California, or any sort of left-wing haven, and right-wingers do this too when they want to outlaw drugs, but I understand drugs more so than soda. Yeah, if uh, you're paying into insurance and insurance companies... People who are a higher risk to using insurance 
and generally drain more resources. I understand that. It's the same thing with drugs. But the left, these people who want universal health care, there's the slippery slope argument because if you pass universal health care, what happens next? They start to control things because they realize that universal health care, well, if you're if it's universal, certain people will drain more resources than other people, which is where we get to the slippery slope argument since, hey, we're providing you this service, therefore we get to pass these laws to make sure that you don't drain the service. These young people talked emotionally about how chronic health problems affect their families in a city where 36% of youth suffer from diabetes or pre-diabetes and shared how the beverage industry misleads consumers about the safety of their products. How are they doing that? How, how are... <laughs> oh, okay. Let me calm down here real quick. How is the beverage industry misleading consumers about the safety of their products? I don't remember it ever being stamped on a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or Mountain Dew talking about how healthy this drink is, how this drink will replenish vitamins, will replenish electrolytes, with the exception of Gatorade. But that's for athletes, and they specifically say that. I don't know any milkshake that's stamped on the back saying, if you drink 10 of these a day, you will lose weight. These people basically are basing their ideology off of a straw man of other businesses and products and want the government to put taxes on something so you are persuaded not to go buy these products because they think they have a choice in what you consume. Hey, okay, don't get me wrong. I understand that soda is a huge problem when overconsumed. And soda isn't the healthiest source of calories for the human body. Diabetes and obesity is a terrible pandemic plaguing America. But who in the world do you think you are if you get to use the force of government to influence people not to choose whether or not they consume a sugary beverage? Listen, you can march. You can advocate for people to take better care of themselves. But you have no right to impose taxes on people who don't live the way you want them to. And like I said, now I understand, okay, let me let me say this again. I understand that people can drain resources. But that's why you should never advocate for universal health care. Because if you pass something like universal health care, then of course, like I said, there's a slippery slope since you'll be using tax money. Here's a list of things you are no longer allowed to do. For health reasons. Otherwise, you might drain resources. This is also why insurance companies should be allowed to raise premiums on high-risk clients. Okay? Just to get into that. Because high-risk clients, are, like I said again, are more likely to use resources pooled together. So, I understand that unhealthy people can use more resources than necessary. I understand that. But <clears throat> imagine that you think you have the right to tell people what they can or can't consume. It, it's nonsense. It, it doesn't make any sense. These people are as bad as people who want to ban fast food. It's not your choice. You have no right to tell me what I can't or can't eat or drink. And I know a tax isn't keeping me from consuming soda if I want to. But it punishes me if I wish to indulge in a tasty treat because you think you have the right to dictate how I live my life. My body... My choice. My body. My diet. My money. My choice. This is just one example of how people like to try to use the government to dictate your life. <clears throat> but it doesn't end there. We have countless examples from minuscule to massive of people, especially the left, trying to control your life. And a lot of people on the right are guilty of it too. So don't get me wrong. So, we've all have heard of gateway drugs. But have you heard of gateway plastic? Plastic straw bands won't help the environment, but that's no reason not to pass them. Or so argue straw prohibitionists who want the little suckers outlawed in the hope of 
provoking environmentally friendly soul searching among inconvenienced consumers. Straw bans aren't going to save the ocean, but they could jumpstart much needed conversations about the level of non biodegradable trash in them, writes Vox's Radika Viswanathan. That's a weird ass name. I'm not racist. Who gets all the facts about straws and their minimal effect on the environment right, but still manages to come out in favor of a ban. Individuals like this, okay, understand, they think they can use legislation to change the world, even though it won't work. They even admit that it won't work. They also admit that it won't work. But they think they can still ban things. Now, I know it's just a straw. I mean, you're probably asking, what's the big deal? But think about it. What is after the straw? If they can ban straws, what else can they ban? Again, I like making the slippery slope argument. What else can they move on to? Ask yourself, how much sense does it make to support and advocate ineffectual bans, hoping that they might, through the power of conversation, cause a change in attitude among Americans? These are petty restrictions on people's behavior and choices. This usually makes people less sympathetic, not more to the cause. The rules are supposed to serve, and whatever benefits they might produce must be weighed against the very real costs they impose on those forced to comply with them. What is the punishment if you decide to suck on a straw? You go and buy your taxed soda and drink it with your banned straw, are you fined? Are you thrown in jail? What happens? <clears throat> like I said, what happens next? What if it fails and you don't garner the support you were after? What do you ban next? See, this is my problem with the authoritarian left. This is my problem with the left in general. Your personal morals and philosophical beliefs should not be the foundation in which legislation is written. At least not entirely. Obviously, everyone who exists will project their philosophical beliefs into a system of government they believe would be the most moral or just. I do it too, which is why I would like to clarify exactly what I mean by that. I have my own personal morals and ethics and political philosophy. Sometimes all of those cross over and influence others. I love the United States of America. I think the United States is the greatest country on earth. With that being said, I will never advocate for using the law to make you stand during the national anthem or respect the flag. I would like it if you did, but I'll never use the rule of law to force you to do that. I love animals, including cats and dogs. I have both. There's plenty of abused cats and dogs out there that need a good home, and I would never dream of forcing you to have one in your home. If you don't want one, I believe in monogamy and marriage. I think the family unit is superior in most instances. And I believe having a mom and a dad at home is the pinnacle of civilization. With that being said, I will never force you to get married or have children or stay with your significant other who turned out not to be so significant. I don't even want to ban promiscuous behavior. Do you see what I'm getting at? I have beliefs as well. I care for certain things. I care for culture. I care for society, for society, but I am not attempting, nor will I ever attempt to use an authoritative institution that has a monopoly on force to make you do something against your will. I would also hope that you'd be kind enough in return in order to return that generosity to me and not to force me to do things that I don't want to do. <clears throat> so, as you can tell, left-wing liberals drive me crazy with all this talk about entitlements and, well, with what I said, they drive me crazy, but with all this talk about entitlements and welfare and universal health care, universal income, free college tuition, they drive me even more crazy. Why? Because it's not fiscally feasible. It's an outlandish utopian prospect to think we'd be able to accomplish any of this. With that being said, is it possible that the government could help those in need or provide some sort of social program? Maybe. 
I wouldn't advocate for it, but if we did establish programs to do these things, we should at least do it constitutionally. In other words, the federal government has no authority to do so, so leave it up to the states. Uh, in the state of Oregon, in my state, we have the Oregon Promise Grant, which was passed, which I believe helped foot the bill for eligible students attending a uh, community college, as, and it works on an as-needed basis. It's not something I support, but it's still a lot better than free college all the way around for universities and everything. Um, should we have a social safety net for the physically and mentally disabled? Maybe. Should we have at least emergency coverage for the poor and elderly? Maybe. Even though I'm against these programs, I sympathize with those who advocate for these types of programs. And we can argue about, we can argue and debate about the role of government in our economy and whether or not they should provide some sort of financial assistance for its citizens. But if you advocate for some sort of social assistance, you better have a plan to pay for it without taxing the ever-living crap out of people. <clears throat> the surge of retiring baby boomers is reshaping the U.S. into a country with fewer workers to support the elderly, a shift that would add to strains on retirement programs such as Social Security and sharpen the national debate on the role of immigration in the workforce. This is what happens when you feel first and think later. This is what happens when you base your political ideology and craft legislation based on your emotions. And then you try to be pragmatic around emotions. Sometimes your emotions betray you. Sometimes your emotions guide you in the wrong direction. It might feel good to implement entitlement programs because it feels good or it'll help the poor or it'll help somebody who needs it, you know, who cares if some people abuse the system, as long as I'm helping at least just one person. So because it feels good, you implement entitlement programs. And the Legislative Assembly votes on the legislation that you crafted. Then the executive signs it into law. Then you have your social program. As a result, you are using emotions over logic. You run into a problem. How the hell do you pay for it? It's not as simple as signing a bill. And then all the money funnels into the right places as intended. You need to then structure an administrative institution to help distribute money into areas where it should go. You have to pay employees, seize property, and pay the basic administration costs in order to do so. Or in order to do this. So how would you pay for it? By increasing taxes. So you can increase spending. Which as a result will take money away from those who are being productive. People who probably need this money to invest in not only their own current standard of living. But also their future retirement. I know it's scary to think about retirement. How the hell are you going to afford it? How are you going to come up with an amount of money that can sustain your existence for another 15 to 35 years? These are tough questions. I have my own opinion on how we could do this without raising taxes or without the government in general, but that is beside the point. Think logically before you legislate. Don't base legislation on emotions. So let's talk about the last thing. Um... I'm tired of the leftists who think they can centrally plan the economy. It hardly ever works. You can't predict the market, and you can't agree on how to spend other people's money. And basically, you screw up. And that was definitely the case for New York State. A New York State agency meant to foster economic growth says spending more than $1 million to rebuild an old movie theater and one of the state's richest countries will create more <laughs> a mere six jobs. I'm sorry. I just can't handle this. The center is being developed by the nonprofit Sag Harbor Partnership, which pledged 13 million toward the project, 
However, they aren't the only investors. The Regional Economic Development Council awarded the Hampton Theater a 1.4 million grant last December through Empire State Development. The result of that massive bill to the taxpayers, six jobs, according to the government's own report. That's over $230 per job. And that's amazing. <clears throat> that is amazing. This goes back to what I said earlier about the government and leftists using their emotions over sound logic. Yes, a movie theater can bring in some temporary economic prosperity, so why not spend $1.4 million in tax dollars to help restore a movie theater in a rich neighborhood where they don't really need the money? I mean, let's be honest. Do they really need the movie theater? Do they really need this movie theater? I mean, can't they afford it themselves? But this is what cronies will do. This is what government cronies always do. I have an idea. Let the market decide. Let the rich pay for their own movie theater rest restoration if that's what they really want. Let someone willingly fill the gap in the market. The economic benefits will be better that way. And it's much better to levy taxes on an organically grown economy rather than spending tax money to try and inflate the economy for votes and an attempt to earn more tax money. Central planning is outdated. Let the markets decide what happens and only intervene if lives are at stake. And I mean it literally, not rhetorically. And that that's it for this episode. Those are the only stories that uh, I have that I want to go over that highlight liberal lunacy. But that doesn't mean that I don't want to continue talking. I just... We're only about 22 minutes into the podcast. So I want to talk about some other things that I want to talk about. <laughs> it's a little redundant, isn't it? Okay, let me drink some water. Uh, <clears throat> I'm having some, some issues this morning. Ugh, let me stretch a little bit. So I just want to talk about what's upcoming for my channel. There will be more Logan for Liberty podcasts that will be in better quality. This one was probably my worst Logan for Liberty podcast. Shorter. Uh, I don't feel like I was in the best top tip condition. But I had to make a video. Or something to upload to the channel. And it's been a while since I've made a Logan for Liberty podcast where you can just turn on a video and just listen to it. You don't have to worry about watching, you can just listen to it. I don't know if my voice is optimal for this type of thing. I don't know if people will get annoyed by my voice. It doesn't matter. But I will try to do a Logan for Liberty at least once every two weeks. If I can, I will pump out a Logan for Liberty every week. So far, I have uploaded a video every day since July 3rd, or was it July 1st? I'm not sure. I've been pretty good with the uploads. Um, I don't want to talk to you about what type of uploads I'm doing. I'm doing whatever, whatever video I really want to do. I will... If there's something I really want to talk about, I will take the time, I will polish it, I will narrate it, I'll make sure there's at least some sort of visual aid or something visually stimulating on the monitor. I will cite sources and references, of course, always, and I will put the links in the description box. As always, if for some reason there's something that's not really a topic that I have a lot to say about, then what I'll do is, is I will make a textualized video, which will be anywhere from a minute to maybe five minutes long, and it'll just be text telling the news story. Um, or I'll do that if I can't do a narration because something's happening at my home and there's a lot of background noises, whether there's construction, there's family over, my dog's barking, whatever it is, um, I have friends over or anything like that. If there's a lot of background noise, then I will make a textualized video for that day. But I have been trying to consistently upload a video 
every single day. I've been trying to make them long and enjoyable. So, uh, so you get the most amount of content for your click or subscribe. And that's really what I'm aiming for. Also, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do book reviews on this channel. It's, it's not going to be me sitting down just talking about books all day, all the time. Reading is good for you guys. No, I, I've been reading. I've been trying to read at least one book every week. I read this book called Gathering Blue. And just to give you uh, the sort of gist of what it is. I'm not going to give you a synopsis or summary. But for anybody who has went to uh, high school, maybe you've read The Giver. Or maybe some of you read the book The Giver on your own. Or maybe some of you went and saw the movie The Giver, which is based on the book The Giver. I believe The Giver, the book, came out in 20... Not the book, the movie came out in 2014. I can't be certain, but it's a good movie. The book is a lot better. Sorry, holy crap. This morning, I just sound disgusting. I am disgusting this morning. I don't know what it is. My nose is stuffy and runny for some reason. Uh, I have some acid reflux. It feels like heartburn. My throat is just really... It's disgusting. I am a gross human being this morning. Somebody should come and just take me out. Take me out of the gene pool. As long as I am the way I am this morning. Anyway, the book I am reading is called Gathering Blue. It is a sequel to The Giver. The book, The Giver, not not the movie, The Giver. Technically, it is a continuation of the story. Whatever, whatever. The book, The Giver, came first. It's a good book. I am going to talk about it thoroughly. I'm going to make a video about the book review. It, the only reason why I'm doing the book review is because I want to talk about the psychological uh, influence or significance of the story. Uh, Jordan B. Peterson has inspired me to do this type of thing, to, to read a piece of art or a piece of fiction, and then just really analyze it to what the author is trying to say. He, Jordan B. Peterson isn't the reason why I'm reading. He's the reason why I want to do a video on a book, a fictional book, and analyze it. Um, I'll probably start reading nonfiction too, something educational. I'll probably do a book review on that too. The next book I'm going to read after I do my review or uh, when I let this video render, is Liberty Defined, which is by Ron Paul. I really want to read a lot about uh, libertarian ideology, whether it be from anarcho-capitalists, minarchists, um, 1776 style constitutionalist right-wingers, uh, conservatives, uh, objectivists, um, classical liberals. I really want to read the ideology about individualism. I want to get studied up. I want to hear all the arguments <clears throat> it closely reflects to how I tend to lean naturally. I, as you can tell from this podcast, I tend to lean towards individualism and liberty. Uh, I guess I'd call myself a libertarian, classical liberal, liberty-minded conservative, constitutionalist, Jeffersonian, uh, Madisonian, uh, right-wing, uh, conservative, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's so many labels that you can put on me. Let's just say, I already said it, but the ideology, or my core principle is individualism, liberty, free markets, peace, and tolerance, and private property. Those are my basic principles that help me guide my way through any ideological problem, philosophical problem or political problem and don't 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 have me mistaken for an ideologue i didn't come to my conclusions from those principles i came to those principles from my conclusions from my thought processes and those for me personally are what i have well basically concluded <laughs> that I went through deductive reasoning, and those became the principles that I think are the best. I think they'll lead to a prosperous, freer society, uh, a society that is just. Um, there's a lot about my country here in the U.S. that we get right, and there's a lot that we get wrong. 
I think it would serve us better if we can if we stuck with the Constitution, or at least the principles behind the Constitution. I think we would be in a much better place. There is a lot that my state of Oregon gets right. There is a lot that my state in Oregon gets wrong. As always, there there's some that California gets right. There's some that California gets wrong. You know it, that that's the case. Um, I'm proud of the United States of America. For some intents, or for, for, for some reasons. <clears throat> Not for every reason. Um, I'm proud of Oregon. Like I said, not for every reason. Well, that'll do it. Um, I'll wrap up this podcast. I will put it in my video editor, render it, and upload it to you guys. This is Logan from Logan for Liberty coming at you from the Pacific Northwest. Have a good one. I hope you all stay free, hope you all stay open-minded, and I hope you all want to learn. Be safe. Thanks for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want more content, don't forget to subscribe so you can check back and see more future videos regarding politics and culture. While you're at it, don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can be notified when a new video is uploaded. Also, check out my links to my Facebook and Twitter in the description box below. Ooh.